I'm getting out of the way now. <laughs> <laughs> this is your show. Uh, man, it's good to see you, brother. How you been? Yeah. You know, I've been, uh, uh, I told you I had a buddy who wanted to take his son to Kansas City, but he, right. he didn't want to. Sorry, we are on live. I am Reagan Starks. I am the program director of the Baseball Heritage Museum. I am here. I'm so excited about this one. We are here with Justice Hill. He is a freelance writer. He covered the Indians for MLB.com for a couple of years. He's a former professor of you know, sports writing and sports journalism at Ohio University. We are also joined with, by uh, Bob Kendrick, who is the president <laughs> of the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. I am very excited about this one. I will let them take it away. Regan, thank you. Thank yeah. you for the uh, introduction. And since they, she didn't go into the details about your background, I will have you tell us, Bob, how did you become interested? How did you become a baseball fan? Because you don't, can't run a museum if you hate baseball. So how did you get there? How did you become a fan? <laughs> You know, I, just as I've been a fan of the game since I was probably five years old, growing up in Crawfordville, Georgia. Crawfordville, Georgia is east of Atlanta, west of Augusta, all of about 500 people. But my father, my brothers, they were all baseball fans. They, my brothers played baseball, and I kind of fell in love with the sport. I taught myself how to read a box score out of the old Atlanta Journal-Constitution. and you know, we, my, my town was too small to field a high school baseball team. But as a kid, we played Sandlot. The older kids would play what they call hardball. You know, they didn't really call it baseball. They called it hardball. And uh, the neighboring counties would come in and they play games. And I'm not lying, man. People would sit on the car hoods and huddle around the old baseball field and you're watching the guys play. And, you know, as a kid, you wanted to emulate those guys. And so I fell in love with the game. I got to Kansas City really playing basketball. You know, so I chased the basketball to Kansas City, but now I make my living in baseball, albeit baseball history. But you know, the, the sport has been near and dear to my heart for quite some time. So when you got to Kansas City, you were doing something else. What was that something else? At well, I landed at Park College, which was now, which is now Park University. And so at the 13th hour, Justice, they, they offered me a basketball scholarship. Now, I'm going to Howard University. I, I'm going to Howard University since the time I was probably 10, 11 years old. I had a brother that was living in Washington, D.C. I would make trips to D.C. every summer to stay with him. So Howard University was my school of choice. Well, I get accepted to Howard, but they wanted me to walk on for basketball, and which I was prepared to do. But at the 13th hour, I get this scholarship offer from Park College in Parkville, Missouri. I didn't know a soul, and, but I went with the money, man. I followed the money to Parkville, Missouri, and, and I've been in the Midwest ever since. And, and so when I graduated, my first job out of school, and, and I, studied, I studied communications art with an emphasis in broadcast communication and journalism. My first job was with the Kansas City Star when I graduated. And, you know, I wanted to get in the building. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I didn't know if I wanted to follow your lead and, and, and work on the editorial <laughs> no! side or if I wanted to actually move over to the marketing PR side. Well, as fate has it or would have it, I ultimately gravitated to the marketing PR side. That's when I got introduced to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Well, it, it was a little bit between graduation and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. How did you make the, make the transition from the Kansas City media to the museum itself? Well, I was senior copywriter in the Kansas City Star's promotions department, which functioned as the Star's advertising agency. And man, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. My boss comes by my desk one day, he says, hey, I got this, I got this piece that I think you'd be interested in. The Negro Leagues Baseball Museum has reached out, wanted some help to promote a new traveling exhibition that they had and I think you'd be perfect to do this and, and that's when I got introduced to the museum and I'll never forget it and I know you knew Don Motley and God bless his soul the first time I go down to see him I walk into his office and I say well 
where's the museum? He said, you standing in it. It was just this little one room with some pictures on the wall. And we were creating a new exhibition in the storefront space right below his, where his offices were. He was up on the third floor. The storefront space was down on the first floor. And that exhibit justice is still traveling today. Is at the Yogi Berra Museum right now, was playing to rave reviews before COVID-19 and this pandemic hit. And, and, and of course they had to alter their ability to move school age groups through there to see it. But the, the exhibit was called, or is called, Discover Greatness, an illustrated history of the Negro Leagues. And so I put the promotional campaign together that drew some 10,000 people to historic 18th and Vine to see that traveling exhibition. And I think it was at that time that the officials there at the Negro Leagues Museum realized we got something pretty special here. And the success of that promotion prompted them to ask me if I would join their board of directors, which I did. I served for five years in a volunteer capacity. So I started with this organization 27 years ago as a volunteer. Who knew? Yeah, who knew that it would lead down this path that it has you know, where I served as, as VP of, of marketing and then now trying to run this great organization. How discouraging really was the early days of, uh, of, of the museum with a lot of people just not knowing a lot about yeah. black baseball? I mean, you're you selling know, something, yeah. a product that nobody really knows or knew, knows about no, you're at absolutely the time. Right. You're absolutely right. But you know, it was never discouraging for me. And maybe because you started to meet people like Buck O'Neill and, and you saw the, the energy and the passion and the belief, you know, because we started this museum, they, you know, this, the museum's 30 years old now, Justin. We celebrated our 30th anniversary a couple of weeks ago and it started in a little tiny one room office. Most museums, as you know, start with an endowment already in place. This one, we're so fond of saying, started with a hope and a prayer, but it always had a dedicated few who believed that this story deserved to be told and that it needed a place to tell that story. And even though we didn't start in a traditional fashion, I don't think anybody ever stopped believing that we could get this done. Now, there were those who were absolutely naysayers because, and they were naysayers, not necessarily because they didn't believe that a Negro Leagues Museum deserved to be built to share the story. They were concerned about where we were building the museum, Historic 18th and Vine. And as you know, Historic 18th and Vine in its heyday was as recognized street cross section as there was anywhere in the world because you had this intrinsic mixture of jazz and baseball radiating from that one street corner. People still come and stand on the corner of 18th and Vine to get their picture taken. But 18th and Vine, like a lot of urban areas, had died. And, and quite frankly, you can trace the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues with the, with the death of so many urban communities in our country. Wherever you had successful Black baseball, you typically had thriving Black economies. 18th and Vine was no exception. So it had been left to die. And so even our most ardent supporters were questioning, why would you try to build a museum here when there's nothing here? But thanks to the infinite wisdom of the late great Buck O'Neill, who said, this is where we will build this museum. This is where the origins of this story started. The Negro Leagues formed in Kansas City right around the corner from where we operate the old Purcell YMCA. So this is where the roots of this story began. We will build here. And when we do, we will resurrect 18th and Vine. I got a question. Did you believe him at the time? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody, anybody in their right mind would have believed it, but Buck always seemed to know. And so you got to follow Buck. If Buck say, this is where we build, this is where we build. And so I come along three years later, the museum is still in its fledgling state, but you could feel some momentum starting to occur. You really could. And we went to work and we went from that one room office in 1990, 
seven years later, we were cutting the ribbon on our new home, a 10,000 square foot state of the art exhibition that cost us about two and a half million dollars. We raised every dime of it on our own. The city of Kansas City had offered us the money, but they would have owned us. And so we turned down two and a half million dollars just as when we have any money. And, and, and the mayor of Kansas City at that time, good friend of ours, Emmanuel Cleaver II, who is now Congressman, US Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver. I know he thought we were crazy. Hell, we thought we were crazy because we turned down two and a half million dollars when we didn't have any money. But we just felt like it was more important for us to control our own destiny. And so we went to work and we raised the two and a half million dollars to build our current home. And, and really, we haven't looked back. 30 years later, we're now recognized as America's National Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And that area has completely changed. People are working, living, and playing again at 18th and Vine. How helpful was having a figure like Buck <laughs> there? Because so oh. by the time by the time I was acquainted with the museum, a lot of the iconic figures in black baseball were gone. But They're Buck gone. thrived. How did, how did he help you guys oh. in, in his role as ambassador? Man, he was a marketing man's dream come true. You know, in Hollywood, just as they talk about the it factor. And, and I don't know what it is, but you know what it is when you see it. And, and whatever it is, Buck had it. And, 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 and people responded to him. And, and so, as I said, he was a marketing man's dream come true. All I'd have to do is say, Buck, here's what I need you to do. He said, going to help the museum? Yep, now let's do it. And, 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 and the, again, the passion, the charisma, energy, it just exuded from him. And, and people were captivated. Now it didn't hurt, right around the same time, Ken Burns introduces Buck to the world. Yeah, and, and you know, because Buck had been a big star in the Negro League, great player in the Negro League. Man, he was a bigger star after Ken Burns' documentary on the history of baseball. America fell in love with Buck O'Neill this very charming, gentle man who was telling these wonderful stories about baseball to baseball fans that they had not heard before. And, uh, and I'm just- interrupt you just for a second. Uh -huh. Could he have made it if he didn't have that, those stories, even though he was an older man, he had these stories that, that just, I mean, they were, they, they were rich in texture and color. If he had been boring, could, could, could he have done what he did? No. No, no, he was this incredible storyteller. And Ken Burns gave him a platform. You know, as Buck would say, he said, Bob, I've been telling these stories for 40 years and nobody would ever listen. Well, Ken gave him a platform and people listened and they fell in love. He literally stole the show in baseball, which was a brilliant piece. Ken is one of the greatest storytellers of the 21st century. But Buck O'Neill really is the guy that everybody remembers. Again, because you had this charming, gentle man telling these stories, and he was doing it, he was doing it with a twinkle in his eye and a smile that lit up the screen. And again, America fell in love with him just as he was 82 years old. When most of us are getting ready to shut it down, it jettisoned an entire new career for old Buck. And God blessed him to live for another 12 years. And he was literally gallivanting across this country, preaching the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum to any and everybody who would listen. And, 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 and I guess I was right there hanging on his coattail. I shut, chime in every now with an amen, <laughs> you no know, preach, brother. And, and, you know, and I was there for the ride. I guess I'm one of his disciples. And, and I was there to witness this, and it was amazing to see. You, you mentioned disciple. That's not quite accurate. He was your best friend, you tell people. He was. He Talk was. Talk about that friendship, Bob. You know, and, and, and just as we're talking about a man who was every, you know, 50 years plus my senior, but he was one of my very best friends. He was my mentor. He was my confidant. And I tell people all the time, man, the smartest thing I ever did 
was I kept my mouth closed and I listened because there was a lot of wisdom that he would offer if you wanted it. He didn't force it on you, but it was there. And, and for me now, I get to share those same stories that he shared with me. I didn't live them, he lived them, but I got them firsthand from the likes of Buck O'Neill and Monty Irvin and Minnie Minoso and Ernie Banks. You know, I've, I'm so blessed that I got those experiences that now I kind of can draw from as I'm trying to lead this organization today. And every time I tell those stories, I feel like I'm keeping those individuals alive in my mind and in my heart. And, and it's something that I absolutely cherish. Well, I've got to, I, I've got to address this topic because you're not going to just talk about it. You know, the museum almost died. It when did. Buck, when Buck when died, died. Yeah. the museum almost died. And yeah. you walked away from it. I did. I did because, and you know, this is very publicly known. It was, it wasn't a good transition plan in place. It's rare, man, that a man 94 years old dies and everybody's surprised. <laughs> yeah, because even though we know that no one's going to live forever, but if somebody was, it was going to be Buck O'Neill. And people were surprised when Buck died. And so you had a 94 year old chairman, you had an 80 something year old executive director in Don Motley. And, and unfortunately there was not a transition plan in place. And so you couple that with an economy that had tanked at that time. And you can see why there was the perfect storm that really just wrecked the museum. Unfortunately, the organization chose someone else to lead it over me. We, we, it was a very con closely contested, but a split board vote. He beat me by one vote. And they hired this other guy to take the, uh, to, to lead the organization. I tried to work with him, but it was pretty apparent because there was so much community outrage that I didn't get the job. The community wanted me to have a job, but the board thought that this guy could come in and do the job. And so I kind of humbled myself. I was prepared to hang in there, but it was very clear that he was never going to be comfortable with me around. I think to some extent, I think he blamed me for the community outrage. But the, you know, the, the museum is so near and dear to me. I never wanted to see anything happen to this organization. So even though I had lost, I was prepared to hang in there and try and continue to contribute as much as I could to this museum. But once it became very apparent that I, he didn't really want me around. I think he felt like I was kind of looming and lurking and looking over his shoulder. And maybe he thought that I would try to sabotage something that he may have. And, and that was never in my heart. I was just, I just don't operate that way. But I made the decision that it was better for me and better for the Negro Leagues Museum if I walked away, because honestly, I did not believe that we were going in the right direction. And I had given everything I had to this organization. I thought that I had proven at that time that I deserved the opportunity and they didn't think so. And that it was better for me to move on so this organization could move beyond everything that was happening. So they throw this big, they throw this big going away party for me, give me all these nice gifts. And 13 months later, here I come back as the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Now I'm wondering to myself, are they gonna ask me for all these gifts back? You, <laughs> well, well, you, well, I, you have to say, because you told me this once, it wasn't easy for you to make the decision to come back. It was not. And what? I know every I know everybody thinks that it was an easy decision because people know how much I love that museum. It was a part of me. I had given so much of my life to that museum. But again, the, the challenge that I had, you know, and, and again, I'm human as well. You know, the mindset is, okay, man, I wasn't good enough the first time around. Now things are going bad. You want me to come back. But the second thing, because I had gotten over that. The second thing was, what happens if you can't fix it? Yeah, because it's human nature. Man, we never remember the guy who messed it up. We just <laughs> remember the guy that was there when the ship sank. 
<laughs> and, and so this is in my mind. If you can't fix it, everybody's going to blame old Bob. Bob, you let the museum drown. You know, and so whatever legacy I had was already in place. The things that we had done when Buck was alive and all these great things, that was already in place. The risk is you may not be able to fix this. But as I thought about this, and I, and you know, I'd be lying. You're not supposed to make these decisions with your heart. You know, you're supposed to make these decisions with your head. But I'd be lying to you if I told you the decision was made with anything other than my heart. The more I'm trying to rationalize to talk myself out of not coming back, Buck is standing on my shoulder saying, son, come on back home. And ultimately, I said, I, said, I got to do this even at the risk of failing, I've got to do this for Buck and I've got to do this for me. And, and I came back and you know the old adage, the good Lord takes care of babies and fools. And I'm not sure which category I fall in, but I feel like Buck has been looking over my shoulder, guiding every step of the way. And, and we've been able to orchestrate an amazing turnaround of his museum. When you, um, when you mentioned if I could term- interrupt real fast, we yes, actually have uh, Jeremy Fedor, historian of the Cleveland Indians, waiting to join the chat. So I'm going to add him in and see if he has anything else he would like to add to us as well. Hi, Jeremy. How are you? Can you hear us? Maybe. Jeremy. Oh, I'll see if he gets on in a minute. You guys can continue. Okay. I <laughs> he was on there and I was like, oh, I should add him. Bob, for somebody who's never been to the museum and you're talking to a group, how do you how do you describe the museum to people? It, it's such a special place. It really is. And for me, if you are a fan of American history, you're going to love the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. If you are a fan of the underdog overcoming adversity to go on to greatness, you're going to love the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. But if you are a baseball fan to boot, you are in hog heaven, as we would say in the South, because you're going to meet some of the greatest athletes to ever play this game. But really what drives this is this incredible story, this incredible story of these courageous athletes who refuse to accept the notion that they were unfit to share in the joys of our national pastime. So you won't let me play with you I create my own, I'll show you. And and that's what drives this. That's why the story, I think justice is so compelling, so awe-inspiring. People come there and they are amazed by what they learn. But to be honest, they're a little dismayed by the fact that I just now had an opportunity to learn it. Why didn't I know this when I was in school? Well, you know, American historians did us all a tremendous disservice. They kept this wonderful piece of baseball and Americana away from us. So really countless generations of us went through our own formal educations without knowing one of the most significant chapters, not in baseball history, but in American history. And that story comes to life, literally, at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And by the time you walk away from that experience, man, you leave cheering the power of the human spirit to persevere and prevail. I tell people all the time, the circumstances that created a need for a Negro Leagues is sad, shameful, sorrowful. Yes, segregation was a horrible chapter in this country's history. But the Negro Leagues themselves, there's nothing sad about this story because this is now triumph over that adversity. And to me, I think that's the thing that surprises people the most when they come. I hope the work that we've done now over the past 30 years, that people come there expecting to meet some pretty good baseball players. And as you well know, you're going to meet some of the greatest to ever play this game. But again, by the time you walk away from this story, you have a deeper, richer appreciation for just how great this country really is, because this story could have only happened in America. And yeah, it's anchored in the ugliness of American segregation. But out of segregation, Rose's Rose is wonderful story of triumph and conquest. One of the things that I've always, that you pointed out to me when we first met, that uh, 
the movie Bingo Long and the Traveling All Stars and the image they have of, of black baseball players uh, hoboing around. That was just not the image that the Negro Leagues. No. That that's not the Negro Leagues. And no. I think if I'm not mistaken, I think you told me that you thought that did a disservice to what the league was. Do you still well, feel that way today? You know, it, it, it's really interesting because. Bingo Long, and I don't know how many who may be tuned in today have seen the film. It's a very important film. It really is. The Negro League players hated the film for the reason that you mentioned, because it casted them as minstrels. And as you've gotten to meet these men, you know, they, they were proud of what they did. They didn't do all that parading in the town, but the Indianapolis Clowns did. It. And so Barry Gordy and Motown produced this film. And, and for those of you who haven't seen it, it is worth a Netflix or whatever way that you get written these movies these days to go in and watch it because it, it starred an all-star black cast. Yeah, this film starred James Earl Jones, Billy D. Williams, and the late great Richard Pryor. But just as the film itself was based on a fictional novel by the same title. So it was never intended to be an accurate portrayal of the Negro Leagues. But it was really the first cinematic portrayal. And so people took it as the gospel. Yeah. And so when Barry Gordy made the film, who was on the set with him? Two guys from the Indianapolis Clowns. So they told the story as they remembered the story. But the rest of these guys, man, they were so proud. They didn't do that. The Clowns pro provided some of that entertainment and those antics. And, and of course, Barry Gordy made this film right after Lady Sings the Blues. And if you ever, if you read the book, Billy D. Williams' character in the book is actually the catcher. But Billy D. is now coming off of Lady Sings the Blues, blockbuster film. All the women fell in love with this very suave Billy D. Williams. So when they casted Billy D. Williams, there's no way in the world you're going to put Billy D. Williams for three quarters of the film in a catcher's mask. <laughs> and so they put poor old James Earl Jones in there. And, and, and Billy D., they switched the role, made Bingo the pitcher. And, and that's how that happened. And, of course, Richard Fry, the comedic genius, is in this film. So it's a very important film, but it was never intended to be an accurate portrayal of the Negro Leagues. When... This year was the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. Uh, can you talk about the origin of that league a little bit and how yeah. all those pieces came together in February of, 20, of 1920? Yeah, and you just mentioned it. February 13, 1920, Andrew Root Foster, one of the most brilliant minds in baseball history, leads a contingent of eight independent Black baseball team owners into Kansas City. They meet at the Paseo YMCA, literally a stone's throw from the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, just right around the corner. And of course, out of that meeting came the birth of the Negro National League, the first successful organized Black Baseball League. The Negro Leagues would then go on to operate amazingly for 40 years, from 1920 to 1960. But it was right there in Kansas City 100 years ago this year that it all started. And Rube Foster stood there at the Paseo YMCA justice and he proclaimed, we are the ship, all else the sea. And I guess you could say that it was the Negro League's declaration of independence. They were serving notice to Major League Baseball that a new player had arrived on the scene to be reckoned with. And, and honestly, Rube thought that he could create a league that was so dynamic that he would force Major League Baseball's hand to integrate, that he would force Major League Baseball's hand to expand. Yeah, so think NFL, AFL, ABA, NBA. Yeah, Root was thinking this in 1920. So he thought that he would, the baseball would ultimately bring in these Negro League teams. And, and he was almost right. Instead, baseball focused on the field 
which ultimately put the Negro Leagues out of business. But on the Rube Foster's model, not only would you have had black players playing in the major leagues, you also would have had black owners, black managers and coaches and traveling secretaries and team physicians well before 1947. Are there some, from what we know about the history of that early meeting, what, what were the challenges that, because these were all wealthy or well-off men who owned teams. I mean, how difficult is it from, from the record that we have Mm -hmm. Was it for this guy to bring all these independent men together to form something? It, it, it was very challenging because there had been some earlier efforts to try to create a Negro Leagues and they had failed. They had failed. And I think they failed primarily justice because they didn't have enough access to stadiums. And what I tell people all the time, fundamentally, the, the difference between the Negro Leagues and Major League Baseball was finances. Those Major League teams had their own stadiums very few of the Negro League teams had their own stadiums. And so they needed that stadium access. Rube Foster was able to do that, which was one of the reasons why he brought J.L. Wilkinson, who owned the Kansas City Monarchs, into the fold. Because, and, and folks, will, if you haven't heard that name, J.L. Wilkinson, also one of the great executives, not in Negro League's history, but in baseball history. But J.L. Wilkinson was white. And Rube Foster did not, initially want any white ownership in his Negro Leagues. But he relented because, number one, he kept hearing these great things about J.L. Wilkinson, who coincidentally owned the Kansas City Monarchs. Buck O'Neill would say of J.L. Wilkinson that he was the first white man he ever met without any prejudice. When there weren't enough hotel rooms to go around, they slept in the same bed together. Wilkinson was absolutely adored by his players because he treated them with great class respect and dignity, and he put together one of the greatest baseball franchises, not in Negro League's history, but in baseball history. There are those who will say that the Kansas City Monarchs were the New York Yankees of the Negro Leagues. There are others who will say that the New York Yankees were the Kansas City Monarchs of the Major Leagues. <laughs> they were that good. But Wilkinson had what Foster needed, and that was access to stadiums. And so he brought Wilkinson in. Wilkinson brings in his charter Kansas City Monarchs and the Negro Leagues take off and had unprecedented success. Year one, over 400,000 folks attended Negro League games. They're off and running, man. And it was all through the brilliance of Rube Foster. Were there any ch real challenges other than the stadiums over the first four or five years, Bob? Yeah, I mean, because again, you're dealing with you're still having to deal with the same challenges as you travel in the highways and byways of this country. In many, in many respects, the baseball field was their sanctuary. But getting to those baseball fields <laughs> was very challenging. And then, of course, as we move into the 20s, we started to move into the Great Depression. And, and also, we lost Rube Foster. Yeah, you know, five years after he creates the Negro League, Rube Foster is in league business in 1925 in Indianapolis and he's exposed to a gas leak in his hotel room. To preface this or to put it in perspective, Rube Foster at that time was perhaps the most influential, some might say the most powerful man in all of, of baseball because what Rube Foster had done when he started the Negro Leagues, he had either ownership or booking rights of four of the original eight teams. And so what he essentially did was he divested ownership of three, kept the Chicago American Giants, but just as in a deal with the Negro Leagues, was paid 5% of the annual gate. Again, 1920, 400,000 fans attend Negro League game. Now, ain't that great at man, but if you get 5% of that, <laughs> you're doing pretty doggone good. And, and Rube Foster ran the Negro Leagues like a tyrant. He really did. He handled every aspect of business operations. And even though the Negro Leagues were succeeding, there were some within the ranks of the Negro Leagues that thought Rube had too much power. So again, he's on league business in 1925 in Indianapolis, sleeping in his hotel room, is exposed to a gas leak. A passerby comes by, smells the gas, kicks in, you know, rescues him. But when he comes out, he was never the same. You know, likely suffered brain damage, you know, as he was exposed to this gas while he was asleep. And this, it, it created this, he would go through violent outbursts of violent outrage 
which forced his family to have to institutionalize him where three years later, he dies of a heart attack. It's an amazing story. I tell people all the time, you can't make this stuff up. One of the most brilliant minds in baseball history dies in an insane asylum. But there's great belief that that gas leak wasn't accidental, that somebody tried to take old Rube out. And when he died, they lied. The fans love Rube Foster. They lined the streets of Chicago for three days to pay their respect to their beloved Rube Foster. But yeah, somebody tried to take Rube out. Man, if there are some great writers out there listening to us talk now, will y'all please come on to Kansas City because there is a TV series waiting to be done. And will you make old Bob the executive producer? <laughs> <laughs> Bob, one of the things that one of the things that Foster did in organizing the league is really expose people around the country to some fabulous talent. Who were some of the great players from the early years that people should uh, should be acquainted with? Well, the first two real superstars of the Negro Leagues, pretty easy: Oscar Charleston and Bullet Rogan. Yeah, they were big, big stars, superstars. And then you've heard Buck talk about Charleston. He believes that Oscar Charleston is the greatest baseball player to ever play this game. Now, he, he thought that Willie Mays was the greatest major leaguer that he ever saw. And most people concur because, as you know, Mays could beat you every way in which you could be beaten. He could beat you with his bat. He could beat you with his arm, with his gloves, with his legs. And, of course, Willie Mays' illustrious career began in the Negro Leagues with the Birmingham Black Barons. But old Buck believed that Oscar Charleston from Indianapolis, Indiana, to be the greatest baseball player he ever saw. So he's with the Indianapolis ABCs in 1920. Well, Charleston was the consummate five-tool guy. Could hit for power, hit for average, could field, could run, could throw. In 1921, just as he led the Negro Leagues in home runs, triples, doubles, stolen bases, and batting average in the same season. Yeah, if you were going to compare Charleston to a major league contemporary, he had the defensive prowess of Tris Speaker, the tenacity of Ty Cobb. He fight you. He fight you in a heartbeat. Yeah, and, and the bat of Babe Ruth rolled into one dynamic package. And the late great Buck O'Neill says he never saw a center fielder who could go back on a ball the way Charleston could, had uncanny instincts, just seemed to know where that ball was coming down right off the crack of the bat. So he played a very shallow center field. And as Buck would say, you couldn't bloop it in front of him. And unless you hit it on a rope, you couldn't get it over his head. You remember the great catch that Willie Mays makes in the World Series, in the polo grounds. And, and as you know, four. yeah, the catch, Really, the throw was better than the catch, but the magnitude of the moment, the great over-the-shoulder running basket catch, which you could have only made in the polo ground. That's a home run virtually everywhere else. And, and But the throw was dynamite, but everybody remembers the catch. Well, all the old-timers in the Negro League say, had that been Oscar Charleston, he'd have been waiting for that to come down. <laughs> <laughs> and then the great Bullet Rogan. Bullet Rogan, if you were to ask historian Phil Dixon, he believed that Bullet Rogan is the greatest baseball player of all time. Bullet Rogan is a Hall of Fame pitcher from the Negro Leagues. But folks, when he wasn't pitching, Bullet Rogan hit cleanup in the Monarchs, in the Monarchs lineup and played the outfield. Lifetime batting average well over 300, so he can win you 20 games. And then he was going to hit 300 plus, play a dazzling defensive outfield. He led the Negro Leagues in stolen bases when he was 38 years old. So while everybody was rightfully excited about Shohei Atani, it gave me a chance to start talking about those great two-way players of the Negro Leagues. This was pretty commonplace in the Negro Leagues because, number one, the roster sizes weren't as large as Major League Baseball. So you didn't have no pitchers who couldn't play other positions. And, and so these guys were dynamite. 
And, and so there were so many of these guys in the Negro Leagues, you know, when we started talking about Bullet Rogan or Martin DeHigo, Leon Day, Hilton Smith, these guys were all great two-way players. But Rogan and, and Charleston were superstars in those early years of the Negro Leagues. One of the things that you guys had planned as part of the celebration earlier this year was uh, a tribute to Charleston yes. because his grave site was unmarked. Can you talk about that celebration and what you guys had wanted to do with it to honor what, as you said, many players, many people say is the greatest Negro Leagues player of all time. Yeah, and, and uh, as we were celebrating and still celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues, we had planned this year-long celebration. The, the first game ever played in the Negro Leagues took place on May 2nd there in Indianapolis between the Indianapolis ABCs and the Chicago Giants. And uh, Oscar Charleston, of course, became the superstar player. Well, in the process of planning to commemorate that first game, we learned that Charleston was buried in Indianapolis in really a nondescript grave site. So I started to dream of this notion of putting a proper headstone on the grave of one of this game's greatest players. You know, so many of these guys played in anonymity. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't die in anonymity. And so I'm on MLB Network doing an interview with Harold Reynolds, and I mentioned the fact that we would like to, you know, put a headstone on Charleston's grave site as we go back to Indianapolis to commemorate that first game. And someone from San Francisco heard the interview, found me, found me, and, and said, I'm going to make the first donation on Charleston's headstone. And so we started a fundraising effort, raised all the money guys over there in, in um, you know, with the uh, Indianapolis Indians. They pitched in to help raise the money for the headstone. And while we, you know, the pandemic wouldn't allow us to be in Indianapolis to do the formal commemoration and have a ceremony, we did place the headstone on the gravesite of Oscar Charleston, who lays at rest in Floral Cemetery in Indianapolis. And so we're very proud of that. I, I really am. And, and I hope that we'll still be able to get to Indianapolis after this pandemic kind of eases this grip on us to still go there and have a ceremony. People should know who Oscar Charleston was. And, and this was part of that effort to bring the needed identity to one of this game's greatest players. You had, uh, as I said, tons of events planned, but one of them you absolutely pulled off. I think you know the one I'm talking about. Share with us the, the, the uh, you, you describe the event I'm talking about, Bob. It's called Tip Your Cap to the Negro Leagues. And when we rolled out our plans on February 13th of this year, just as we went right back into the Paseo YMCA 100 years from the date that Rube Foster formed the Negro Leagues. And man, I'm so happy, you know, we've got this great plan and I've got Commissioner Manfred with me. I've got Xavier James, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Players Association, he's there. We've got the Mayor of Kansas City, Quentin Lucas, John Sherman, the new owner of the Kansas City Royals, he's there. The great Frank White, eight-time Gold Glove winner, Kansas City Royal Hall of Famer, now Jackson County executive, he's there with me, and the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Missouri, Mike Kehoe. So we all gather there at the YMCA. We make the announcement of this year-long celebration. Major League Baseball and the Players Association make a joint $1 million contribution in support of the museum. And, and of course, the centennial celebration. Man, we're off and running. We announced that June 27th was going to be our National Day of Recognition. And uh, you know me, I, you know, every time I get a check, I'm happy. You know that. <laughs> but man, I was just as excited about getting baseball for the first time ever. All 30 major league teams were going to honor the Negro Leagues on one single day, June 27th. They're going to wear our patch, centennial patch, and we were going to do this tip your cap kind of themed event with players and fans in stadiums. Well, 30 days later, <laughs> on June 
all heck breaks loose with this coronavirus. I ain't know nothing about no coronavirus. You know, I had no idea. And it killed everything. And so it became increasingly clear that this June 27 date wasn't going to happen. At that point in time, we didn't even know if baseball was coming back because they were in very contentious negotiations about whether or not they were going to bring our game back between the Major League Baseball and the Players Association. And so it was at that point out of necessity that I'm digging into my bag of tricks to try to come up with something that we could do to try and save that event. And that's when I came up with the idea of doing a virtual tip your cap. And, and I called my good friend, Joe Posnanski, you know, Joe. Yeah. And I called Joe and Joe, we, you know, we jokingly say that we're brothers and, and he is, he, he's my brother. And every time that I have a crazy idea, he's the person that I reach out to, to vet those crazy ideas. And so I called Joe, I said, Joe, I got this idea to see if we can't do a virtual tip your cap to the Negro Leagues to see if we can't get some current, maybe some former players and some fans to take a picture or video of themselves tipping their cap. Well, as you know, in our sport, there's nothing more honorable that a baseball player can do than just a simple tip of the cap because it is the ultimate show of respect. Well, he reaches out to his business partner a tremendous communication strategist out of DC named Dan McGinn. He shares the idea with Dan. Well, Dan thought it was a great idea too. And so the three of us went to work and on June 29th, we rolled out two days after when our national day would have taken place. We rolled out this campaign called Tip Your Cap to the Negro Leagues and we rolled it out with four US presidents tipping their cap. President Obama, President Carter, President Bush, and President Clinton. But then also Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and Billie Jean King and Bob Costas, Henry Aaron, uh, Conan O'Brien, Stephen Colbert, the Motown legendary group, The Temptations. And all of a sudden, this thing just took off. But just as when we went literally into outer space and got a tip of the cap from astronaut Chris Cassidy, who was aboard the International Space Shuttle, I knew then that we had done something pretty doggone special. And, and this thing just went viral. And, and so you don't set out to say we're going to launch a campaign and it's going to go viral. That stuff just happens. So if I told you that I knew that this was going to be that big, I'd be lying to you. you know. But it, it just fills me with great joy and pride to see this take off the way that it did and fans and fans of the game and other folks really got involved with this and they started posting their pictures and taking these videos. The national TV networks jumped in on this and there we were on the Today Show and Good Morning America, CBS Morning News, CBS Evening News, ESPN, all over the place. And then that led, as baseball came back, we were able to do our National Day on August 16th. And albeit there were no fans in the stands, but this thing was amazing. Because I do think that because the team's weren't so locked down with so many activities that they really did focus on this 100th anniversary and they were engaging their fan base with this celebration. And to see the Negro Leagues and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum trending on social media, man, it, it, it just made me smile. And I remember August 16th, it was a 17 hour day for me just as I started at five in the morning doing the Korean Baseball League interviews. And I ended about 10 o'clock that night. And so I am totally exhausted, but it was the most gratifying level of exhaustion that you could possibly have because throughout the course of that day, my mind continually reflected to my friend, Buck O'Neill. When I met Buck in 1993, one of the first things that I ever asked him was what motivated you to build a Negro Leagues Baseball Museum? And man, what he said to me 
was very succinct, but also very profound. And it was simply so that we would be remembered. And on August 16th, they were being remembered in ways in which I don't think Buck would have ever dreamt. And, and so it was special. And so anytime that you can make something out of nothing, you know, because I, I'm not lying. When this coronavirus thing hit, it knocked the wind out of my sails because we had put so much energy and we had planned, we got this great vision for this celebration. Now it's time to execute and you can't. All the big events that we had wanted to do, we could not do. And, and, and I, it did, it knocked the wind out of my sails. But as I tell people all the time, if you're going to be a steward of this story, you can't wallow in self-pity. It would be doing a disservice to all of those who call the Negro Leagues home. And so for me, I use a bad baseball analogy to describe coronavirus. Coronavirus was that big, nasty right-hander who just threw one high and tight and knocked you down. So now you got to get back up, dust yourself off, get back in the batter's box, and try to figure out how you're going to hit that sucker. And that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to figure out how we're going to hit old coronavirus, and, and we've had some success. And, and I think my team, if I embody that spirit, they follow suit. And, and, but you know, this story is about resiliency. And, and, and I'm proud of what we've done in what has been such a difficult and challenging year, not just for the Negro Leagues Museum, but for virtually everybody in this country. And yet we've been able to come through this. And as you well know, as if a pandemic wasn't enough, we move into a realm of social unrest and civil unrest that was damn near reminiscent of the 1960s. And so all of a sudden, here's people turning to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum for thought leadership. And I guess if I was going to take any solace out of everything, these last several tumultuous months in our country as we deal with social injustice and systemic racism, it is the fact that people turn to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and it's with the understanding that this museum is a social justice museum. It's a civil rights museum. It's just seen through the lens of baseball. But as I say, it is triumph over that adversity. One of the things that you've always told me is that you believe that uh, baseball, black baseball in particular, doesn't get enough credit for it what it did to the civil rights movement. Yeah. Why do you feel that way, Bob? Yeah, because to be honest, guys, every time these players stepped to the plate, they were swinging for justice. They were swinging against inequality. They were trying to prove a point that they were as American as anyone. And so this would be the league that would give us Jackie Robinson. And there's no question that Jackie Robinson's breaking of the color barrier wasn't just a part of the civil rights movement, it was the beginning of the civil rights movement. It's 1947. This is well before those more noted civil rights occurrences. This is before Brown versus the Board of Education. This is before Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the bus. As old Buck would say so eloquently, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was only a sophomore at Morehouse when Robinson signed that contract to play in the Dodgers organization. President Truman would not integrate the military until a year after Jackie. So for all intents and purposes, this is what started the ball of social progress rolling in our country, baseball. And our country literally jumped on the coattail of baseball. Are there some things that, that you still have planned that you're gonna to try to work into 2020 as it rolls into 21 as a final salute to that hundred years? Oh yeah, man, absolutely. Because, you know, like I said, coronavirus, for, for, it forced us to have to pivot. It forced us to be creative. So once I knew we weren't gonna be able to do the big events that had, you know, group gatherings, you know, we instantly rolled into movement. And so I came up with the idea of Negro Leagues 101. And so we gonna keep the celebration going. 
And, and for anybody who's ever stepped foot on a college campus, man, the one-on-one courses were the only ones I passed, Professor Hill. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so next year, we're going to launch a very aggressive and sweeping educational initiative. We're looking at having our 101st anniversary gala, coincidentally, on what would be Buck O'Neill's 110th birthday on November 13th of next year. So now we're going to keep the celebration going. We're not going to let coronavirus stop that from happening. And so we're, but we're really excited about some of the plans and hopefully some of the alliances that we can create along the educational front. We're working diligently to create virtual museum experiences, uh, some virtual reality experiences that we're working on, a new groundbreaking exhibit that's called Barrier Breakers that will become a traveling exhibition, will be number eight in our stable of traveling exhibitions. And the Barrier Breaker Exhibit Justice will chronicle all the players who broke their respective Major League teams color barriers. We know the story of Jackie Robinson and we know it intimately. But <laughs> the other guys don't get any love. You yeah. know, the folks in Cleveland know this extra extraordinarily well as Larry Doby would break the color barrier in the American League just weeks after Jackie. But as we so typically do in our society, we always celebrate the first. Second guy never gets any love. And if you're number 16, you can pretty much forget it. But every one of those players went through the same set of circumstances that Jackie did. I can tell you now, it didn't get any easier for Pumpsy Green. 12 years after Jackie breaks the color barrier, Pumpsy Green is the last guy to sign with the Boston Red Sox to complete the integration cycle. Well, it didn't get any, any easier for Pumpsy Green in 1959 in Boston than it did for Jackie in 1947. So they all had their trials and tribulations as they were trying to kind of create a pathway into Major League Baseball. And so we felt like it was important that they be more than just footnotes in baseball history. And if we don't tell the story, who will? And so look for that traveling exhibition next year. We've already put a uh, permanent installation that looks at the barrier breakers inside the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, uh, which I'm really proud of. And we're working on a second phase that will look at the impact of World War II, which ultimately is what led us down this path of integrating America's pastime, because sentiment was, if they can die fighting for the country, why can't they play baseball in this country? One of the things I think that you've always been a big proponent of is using the Negro Leagues as a vehicle for re-energizing baseball in the Black community. How are you, what are you doing on that front? I know that's always been an important part of you because to remember the past and look at the numbers of black kids who aren't playing baseball anymore. Uh, what, what is the museum doing and working with maybe Major League Baseball or other partners on that front? Well, it was really important. You know, I think it's as important part of our mission as the work that we do to preserve this history. And so we continue to kind of advocate and want to promote this sport. But it's so important, Justice, that we have a place as we try to introduce this game to urban kids that they can come and see people who look just like them, who played this game as well as anyone ever played this game. But as you well know, they not only played the game, they own teams and they fulfill all these other roles within the business of the game of baseball. Well, for me, baseball is perhaps the most aspirational of our sports. You have to see yourself doing this to want to play it. And, and so with the declining number of American-born Blacks in our game, they don't really have much to aspire to. And our game went from being a blue-collar sport to essentially a country club sport now because it's played totally organized. So those days of Sandlot baseball, and I can tell you, it saddens me to say this, but the days of Sandlot baseball are over. I hope I'm wrong. I wish that we could get the Sandlots going again where kids just got together. It wasn't organized. 
You didn't have to have nine players on a team. You just divided the number of kids that you had, and then you made up your rules as you went along. So if you hit the ball to Miss Jones' yard, you were out. You know, and, and but that's how we grew up playing the game. Well, now this game is so organized and it's so you got to have all this specialization in it. You got to play on these travel teams, the league fees, the cost of equipment. So it has literally priced out a lot of kids, particularly those who are coming from single parent homes, from having the opportunity. And then the other thing that hinders our sport is that there are not really enough full ride scholarship opportunities to incentivize playing the game. So now if I'm a parent and I've got to make this choice, I'm going to lean to basketball and football because this is going to be the best opportunity for my child to get his college or her college education paid for. And so we've got some work to do, but I do think it's so important that we have a Negro Leagues Museum so that kids can draw inspiration from those greats of the past to, so that they understand and identify that they have a proud legacy in this sport. Man, we played this game as well as anybody ever played this game. Bob, is there a place in the museum at all for the Lou Brock, the Joe Morgan, the Gibson, uh, black men who, who've died? No, I know they didn't play in, in the Negro yeah. Leagues, but is there a place to remember them there? Oh, oh absolutely, be? absolutely. And that was one of the reasons, Justice, that we created the event called the Hall of Game where each year we honor former major leaguers who we believe played the game the way they played it in the Negro Leagues. So you played it with passion. You played it with great skill, but you also played it with, as the kids would say, a little swag, because you know you had to have that if you were playing in the Negro Leagues, but that's where that legacy kind of continues, that continuum, so to speak. So the players that you talked about, and sadly we've lost so many of those guys that you just mentioned, and Bob Gibson and Lou Brock and, and Joe Morgan, they're the players who crossed over that bridge that was built by the Negro Leagues. Yeah, they are direct descendants, so to speak, of those who played in the Negro Leagues because they were that wave of Black players that followed Jackie into the major leagues. And, and so, yeah, no, and, and so as we build now the Buckle Neal Education and Research Center, that is when we start to look at those great black stars. You know, one of my favorite factoids as it relates to the Negro Leagues and the immediate impact that the Negro Leagues had on Major League Baseball. From 1949 to 1959, nine of 11 National League most valuable players were former Negro League stars. And that group that you're talking about makes up a, a, a bunch of those, you know, MVPs. And then we didn't even talk about rookies of the year. <laughs> no, these most valuable players. And, and as you know, the National League was far more aggressive in signing that black talent than the American League. The American League was very slow. They really did not want to sign black players. And as the late Bob Gibson would say, they thought that the American League was a place that old baseball players went to die. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if, if you had one last thing to say to people about why this, uh, they should come to the museum, what would you leave them with? Because this is the story of America. It's the story of America at her worst, but it's also the story of, of America at her triumphant best. And as we kind of deal with the issues that we're dealing with now, I think it's important that we have a place like the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I think the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is more important right now than ever before, because this story is such an inspirational, compelling, awe-inspiring story of these courageous athletes who just would not accept that I can't do this. And so they were able to rise above whatever social adversity that confronted them. There's something very American about this story, even though they were being treated as un-American as anyone could possibly be treated, yet they were able to forge a glorious history in the midst of an inglorious time in American history. 
And the place to get that story is in Kansas City at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And as I tell my guests all the time, the Negro Leagues Museum doesn't need to survive. It has to survive so that we don't lose this precious piece of baseball and Americana, so that our children will have a place where they can come and learn something that none of us as adults were privy to during our own formal educations, but not only learn it for its rich educational value, but also its tremendous inspirational value. If you walk away from an experience at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, folks, with nothing other than this. What the Negro Leagues teaches us is very simple. In this great country of ours, if you dare to dream and you believe in yourself, you can do or be anything you want to be. You see, they dared to dream of playing baseball. Just as they had no idea they were making history, they didn't care about making history. They just wanted to play ball. But the pride, the passion, the determination, the courage, the perseverance that they demonstrated in the face of adversity. Again, our story, y'all, is not about the adversity, but rather what they did to overcome the adversity. And that's the real story. And that story transcends race, it transcends age, and it transcends gender. And the legacy of the Negro Leagues has to play on. Well, there's another reason to go to come go to Kansas City though. It's called the Peace Tree <laughs> Cafe. <laughs> it used to be a joining. It's after you go to the museum and then you just slide over to the Peace Tree Cafe. <laughs> and the best sweet potato cornbread muffins on absolutely, the absolutely, absolutely. Forget about the barbecue. I mean, it's it's great, but the Peachtree Cafe was in a league of its own in someplace else. I don't know why they did that. But Bob, I really want to thank you for uh, giving us your time tonight. And unless uh, uh, Reagan has some questions from some people, uh, I just want to. Uh, it's back to her. Yeah, thank you guys both so much for being on with us and doing this. We do have a few questions if you guys are willing to answer any of them. Okay. Of course. All right, so the first one is, what is the biggest hurdle you faced throughout the growth of the museum? Oh, it's always about raising money. Mm. <laughs> you know, I tell people all the time, anytime they say it ain't about the money, it's always about the money. And, <laughs> and try to raise money, as you well know, to keep a museum like ours, a, a cultural institution solvent, is perhaps the most challenging thing that we do because most of the people that I'm knocking on their doors, particularly early on, so many of them didn't even know that a Negro Leagues existed, no less the magnitude in which it did exist. So you have to educate them and then convince them that this is something that is worth supporting. And, and of course, Negro Leagues baseball hadn't been played in 60 years. Mm -hmm. So people don't always grasp why this story is so profound and so special, and so my job is always about selling them uh, on, on the richness of the story and then trying to convince them to support this so that we can continue to do the outreach efforts and keep this museum as solvent as we possibly can. Yeah, um, that sounds about right for a museum and our culture institution. <laughs> well, so let we, me add something to, to that yeah, a little bit. Because Bob is really modest. When he came back to the museum, uh, after leaving, the museum was a million dollars in debt, or according to various articles I read. And he, he, through magic or whatever, he wiped <laughs> away that debt. And the museum now, from all indications, is solvent. You know. Yeah. No. And I we, think nobody expected him to turn it around as quickly as he did. And yeah, you no, know, we've been blessed. We've been operating in the black for the last nine years, and, and we continue to be successful. And but then, you know, a lot of that goes to the fact that so many have come on board to support and even more so this year because we were closed for three months. Yeah, mm -hmm. we were closed from March 14th through June 16th mm -hmm. with no operations. The place was completely dark. And yet we saw this overwhelming groundswell of individual donations come into play. And they've kept this museum healthy and strong. And, you know, like everybody else, we're trying to fight our way through this pandemic. But, you know, thanks to the support of so many, we've been able to do just that. 
And, and so, you know, we're proud of that. And, and we've just got to keep on plugging away, though. Mm -hmm. um, the second question is, you know, you mentioned that Buck O'Neill was your best friend. They like said you had to know Buck O'Neill pretty well. What is your favorite on the field story or personal experience with him? Oh, wow. There were so many that there, there really were. And, you know, because I travel all over the country with Buck. And there were so many car rides and plane rides and breakfast and lunch and dinner and times on the golf course with him that, you know, just so many. But what I think I remember the most about Buck among all the great stories that he shared with me is one thing that really struck me. You always felt better leaving Buck than you did when you came to see him. And y'all, there's just not many people that impact you that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was something very innate about this man and people were drawn to him. He loved people and people loved him back. And, and when he passed away 14 years ago, people would call me because they knew I was devastated and they were devastated by the, by the death of this man. And they would call me and they would say, you know, a chance encounter with Buck O'Neill changed my life. You know, I started to look at life differently. And, and Reagan, we would go places, we'd be in the airport and if he didn't know you, he'd come right up and introduce himself to you. I'm Buck O'Neill, what's your name? And mm -hmm. then they would in, engage in a conversation and by the time we would be walking to our perspective gate, they were sharing and embrace as if they'd known each other all their lives. Mm -hmm. The man absolutely never met a stranger in his life. And mm -hmm. I think that is what I remember the most about him. What, what exemplifies the kind of person Buck O'Neill was, I'm surprised Bob didn't, 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 didn't say this. In 2007, there was a, a effort to uh, make amends by putting Negro League players into the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. who, were, who had been overlooked. Mm -hmm. And so in the voting, a lot of really great players got in, but Buck didn't. Mm -hmm. Buck, because uh, everybody who got in had, 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 had died. Buck, <laughs> instead of refusing mm -hmm. to speak, he spoke, because I was there, he mm -hmm. gave a speech on behalf of those men that, I mean, left people in tears. He didn't have to do that. And mm -hmm. a couple of months later, he died. He died, mm -hmm. yes. I, that, yeah. That was I, his I, last honestly, public e event, was it, was it Bob? You know, we, he did an event with the T-Bone, but it was his last public speech. Yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, I tell that story. I think it was Buck's finest hour mm -hmm. because you're right. He was there speaking on behalf of 17 dead folks who did not have a voice. And he spoke when people were saying it should have been your, in his induction speech, that he was speaking on their behalf, which I still say is one of the most selfless acts in American sports history. And a little over two months later, he passed away himself mm -hmm. at age 94, a month shy of his 95th birthday. And, and the way he handled with such grace, class, and dignity, the results of not getting in. He missed by one vote. Mm. They missed by one vote. And, and everybody was upset, except for Buck. Everybody was, else was upset. Well, I, it's 14 years later, I still get mad when I tell the story. That's probably why I didn't tell the story. Just mm -hmm. gonna make me mad again. No. <laughs> it, it, was, it was more than just the speech though. Mm -hmm. He was there for all the ceremonies and stuff. Oh, I, I tell absolutely. Bob all the time. They no, no, gonna... but I mean, you know, and to the Hall of Fame's credit, because they didn't have to do anything. They came back and created the Buck O'Neill Lifetime Achievement Award and erected a life-size statue of Buck. And it's almost poetic that when you walk into the Hall of Fame and you start to take the, the ramp up into the exhibit space, who's there to greet you? Buck O'Neill. Yeah. Something very poetic about that. Yeah. And so for them to do that, because it's, it wasn't token in nature, it's mm. quite significant. And every time they give the Buck O'Neill Award, you have to remember Buck. So he lives in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. He sounds like he was an amazing man. I, I wish I had met him. He All made right. you cry. 
<laughs> yeah, a little bit. He was just an amazing, he was an amazing man. Yep. All right, I'm going to start, I'm going to finish with two kind of more light questions. So James Earl Jones also did Field of Dreams and The Sandlot. He seems like a big baseball fan. Has he ever connected with the museum and worked with you guys? He has. He's the, the voice of our featured film oh. that's entitled They Were All Stars. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we were very proud to have him lead, lend his wonderful voice. He is the voice in Hollywood, you know, from yeah. that perspective. And so to have him uh, voice our featured film is special because the kids recognize him as the voice of Darth Vader <laughs> and we as adults recognize him as one of the great voices in Hollywood. Yes. Awesome. So one more for you guys. Um, is the story true about Rube Foster allowing Jack Johnson to disguise himself as a Negro League player to escape the law? That is absolutely the truth. Oh my Rube goodness. had his own private rail car. Mm. And, 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 and Reagan, you would rarely ever see the players outside the ballpark not dressed. Mm -hmm. But in this particular instance, Rube put everybody in a uniform and booked Jack Johnson in the uniform, in the Chicago American Giant uniform. And you know, they always say black, all black folk look alike. <laughs> and so he was, a <laughs> <laughs> he was able to get him into Canada, you know, as a result before Johnson was ultimately uh, kind of encountered by the federal feds. But okay. yeah, that, that is the story that happened that Rube helped him escape into Canada. Oh, and if it's God. not a true story, it sure is a good story. Good story. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh my goodness. All right. Thank you both so very much. I appreciate you both being on. I'm going to plug a few things for the Baseball Heritage Museum and I hope you guys both have a good Saturday night and a good rest of your weekend. Bob, thank you. Yes. Reagan, thank you for doing thank this. I enjoy it. Thank you guys both so much. Um, I'm going to plug, I have an interview on October 26th with Terry Pluto, just as you know who that is. Yep. Consummate Cleveland sports writer. I'm very excited about it. Um, in person, we have a boo at the Baseball Heritage Museum event, October 30th and 31st. It will be our, um, you know, our Halloween event. We'll have candy, the Rock Halls, Joy Van will be there. We will have games, all sorts of things. Baseball costumes are definitely encouraged. We want to see them. And then on November 3rd, I have an interview with Lou Rogers, who is the hot dog guy in Cleveland. So again, thank you both so very much. It was a pleasure to be on with you both. I hope you guys have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Take care, Bob. Bye, guys. Just yep. great to see you, man. Reagan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.